Look, it's really good to be able to speak last because we've heard from the regulators, we've heard from industry, there's, there's a good academic argument to why we do this, but let's face it, you guys are all consumers, as am I. The rubber hits the road with the relationship between the retailer and the trust the consumer can have in their product. So I'm going to tell you guys a bit of a story from a Bunnings aspect as to how we've gone about that. Oh, no, this is touchy. Beautiful. Hang on, that's all right, I've got it. Heavy-handed. Okay, now that um, lets me go into there. Put it on presentation. Full screen. No? Oh, that's a really good start. <laughs> Apologies, guys. So never give me an iPad because the, the strength in this finger clicks the screen about three times before I realise what I've done. But look, not to take away from my lead-in, I think it, it's, it's very important that we realise we've heard all about food security and food production and all of that this morning, but this is quite a different little subset of something that's going on globally that's quite important. And uh, I, I wonder if a bear's actually missed out on some, some key research when they're talking about food security because I think there's going to be a sausage and bread bun shortage in Australia if, if uh, bunning sausage sizzles and the community groups keep going the way they are um, because there's an enormous amount of activity that goes through that on any weekend. Um, without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little story, a bit of background about Bunnings and um, how we approached the issue of sustainable timber. And my background is in risk management. I learnt that environmental and sustainability became part of that subset at a very early stage in my career. Um, and, and to ignore it is a risk in itself. So this is really a story about risk management, effectively, and how to maintain brand and reputation. And uh, that's, that's the approach um, that we've taken with this. Now, I'll move through a little bit of history about the business just so we're all on the same page and then quickly as I can into timber specifically. All right. Talked about a 250-year-old business in the UK, Andy. You know, the, the colonialists have been around for a lot shorter period. So 125 years is a pretty good run for a family uh, company that started in WA back in the 1800s. And um, interestingly, their core business was logging. There was a lot of trees that had to be chopped down and... They created a business, the Bunnings Brothers, created this business around logging. And that morphed in through various diversification and uh, acquisitions and then ownership under West Farmers, which gave us the capital we needed to move into the big box formats that uh, you guys uh, love today. And, you know, look at the, the store rollout. We've got 211 warehouse stores in Australia. And that puts us in a very fortunate position but there's a lot of accountability that goes with, with enjoying that sort of brand reputation and recognition. And um, that certainly is the basis of our sustainability efforts. And it, you can't underestimate the fact that when you come from a business like this, the family feel and, and the personal relationships you have with your customer are something that's, that's been a secret of Bunnings. And I'm happy to say, having worked for them for 15 years, that um, that's the way we uh, run our business. There's some principles that I'm going to talk about that let you know why we do what we do. Here they are. These are the four principles that drive our business. I hope you're familiar with each one of those. And particularly number four, let's not deny that sustainability is a three-legged stool. If you don't get number four right, um, you don't enjoy the benefits to be able to play sustainably. Um, so we can't discount that. But obviously the winning offer is the whole lowest prices, widest range, best service. Number two is very important about the culture of our business because we really do work hard to have an engaged family feel, uh, listen and respect our team members and our customers and other stakeholders. And um, fundamentally, that building trust has, uh, I think, played a big part in us uh, enjoying the position we do with our customers. Um, it's based on a li we live here too philosophy. We don't see ourselves as separate from the community. We actually see ourselves as integral to that. Um, in part is why a lot of the things we do, including our timber policy, is not something we speak about publicly very often. 
there's a, a sense of humility that goes around why we do what we do and uh, we don't seek to leverage from that. Uh, we'd prefer people just um, discover that and, um, and are happy with what we do when they understand it. Um, giving back to local communities is a big part of this and you can see how this is building into sustainability and the need to have a good ethical sourcing approach, particularly to timber. Let's just, um, before I go on to this one, uh, do, do uh, talk about the fact that, that this is a very successful business model. Okay? Bunnings has enjoyed um, fantastic growth in sales uh, and turnover um, like no other business in Australia for many, many years now. And so there are a lot of drivers as to why we have to get something like ethical sourcing right in our supply chain. And um, you know, the choices that we've made in this area is to really be socially responsible, environmentally aware, and economically viable. That's, that's our overarching sustainability, well, business vision, if you like. And um, this is really driven by the fact that retailers such as ours are looked upon to be the game changers. Businesses can innovate and undertake things like sustainability in their supply chains far quicker than any government ever can. So we've, we've adopted a leadership position uh, having had a timber policy in place since 2001, which has led us on a journey to establish chain of custody within our supply chains so we understand where our timber products are coming from back to the forest source. And um, we'll talk about that as we go forward. But this is directly linked to our brand and reputation, folks, and it's integral to our business agenda. When you look at our our um, strategic plan, sustainability and ethical sourcing is embedded in our strategic plan for the business. These are our people that make it happen, the smiley faces in the red shirts. Okay. The disclaimer here, there is no perfect world. How do you have growth at all without some level of impact? How do you have consumption at all without some level of impact. So there are trade-offs here, folks. We're not saying we're perfect by a long shot. There's a lot of work to be done, but we're certainly committed and are on the pathway. Um, you know, there, there are all sorts of things here that are in conflict with sustainability. Uh, things like a massive network growth plan that we have is going to increase our carbon footprint in absolute terms. Regardless of all the energy efficiency processes we'll put in place, that's a challenge for our business. Um, when we're talking particularly about timber products and sustainable timber products, there's an embedded cost in the supply chain in doing that. Who's going to pay? Are you? Are you going to pay more for the certified outdoor furniture setting that you buy? Arguably, most people won't. There's a few of us that do. But that's an emerging market, which is great. So these are the, the four sustainability platforms that we have in our business. I'm just going to talk about timber. That's what you see when you walk into a Bunnings store. I, I guess there's a few tragic DIY people in the room, as am I. Um, but realistically, you look at Bunnings and you can see we're into timber. It is a major part of our product offer in our stores and takes up a big um, space in our stores. Comparatively, it's our primary ethical sourcing risk. So if we go back to risk management again and we look at where the biggest risks exposures are from a brand and reputation issue, getting something like this wrong and being associated with anything to do with illegal logging is just not smart. We can't afford to do that. So primarily, uh, yeah, we've had this approach in our business for many years now to make sure that we're ahead of the game, um, that we, we really are pleased to see the logging uh, legal logging laws come into play in Australia because effectively that takes out the free riders that Andy was referring to because there has been a lot of pain along the way in taking these early adopter type positions. You embed a lot of cost in your business that your competitors don't and um, I see illegal logging as helping us equal the playing field somewhat. Um, the little story I'd like to tell you is it wasn't all um, beer and skittles for Bunnings and a brand reputation aspect when it came to forestry products. I don't know if any of you uh, remember the late 1990s, particularly back in WA, 
there was some heated conflict with NGOs around uh, Bunnings being associated with old growth logging in the southwest forests of WA. And, uh, and when I came on board, um, one of my first jobs of, as a risk manager was to contain the activities of, of costumed protesters um, <laughs> trying to disrupt the opening of new stores in WA. And you look back on that and you think, uh, the point that we've got to now with the likes of uh, you know, the major NGOs in Australia, where we're sitting around the table and we're collaborating for common outcomes, um, we've really come a long way. And we've learnt a lot by actually opening the door and, and being prepared to listen to those arguments. And we will not agree with everybody all the time, but to just be able to take on board that opposing view and, and consider you know, how you can play the game better together it has been a big plus. So we actually got some advice from Greenpeace and WWF back in 2001 when we formulated our timber policy. And we still keep that, that um, consultation open and we have regular discussions about timber supply chains and where things are going. Um, we actually have remained a, a, a retail member of the Global Forest Trade Network, which is a WWF organisation that promotes um, market linkages for sustainable timber. So that helps us find timber that will meet our procurement standards overseas, and we're grateful for that. The overarching position of our policy is to get to that perfect end game, which is all products are able to have chain of custody linked back to credible certification and verification to ensure they are from legal and well-managed forest sources. Now, you don't get there overnight. Uh, there, there is going to be a bit of a shockwave through, uh, I think, some parts of uh, the smaller part players in Australian industry coming to terms with this new legislation because I reflect on how for the first probably five years that we survey, surveyed our supply chain, um, we were still getting suppliers, you know, people involved in importing timber, telling us they didn't know where it came from. And we kept pushing. We kept raising the bar and requiring those, those answers to be declared to us and moving on, losing business, having to walk away from suppliers who actually couldn't measure up to that. Thankfully, 10 years on, we have a fairly good level of transparency about our supply chains. This is one of, one of those fantastic achievements. Since 2007, we're able to procure enough FSC outdoor furniture product to have a complete range, which is FSC only. Um, and because that's one of the, the products that a lot of people do discriminate when they're purchasing and are looking for environmental credentials, it was a good way of promoting uh, that concept and the concept of certified timber. All right. Why do you think that slide doesn't say 100%? That'd be pretty bold, wouldn't it? as complex as this issue is, to ever get to the point, hand on your heart, you can say 100%, I think we all have to recognise our capacity to fail. Some of this comes back to a point where trust is the last point that you can go back to. You know, you can't dig to the nth degree uh, through very complex supply chains, and you come to a point where you verify it as much as you possibly can, and then you have to trust to a certain degree. Um, and you learn from being burnt when that trust is abused, then you develop your policies to fill those gaps. But um, we, we, will, we will always say we recognise the capacity to fail, and when we do, we'll fix it. It's taken us a decade to get to this point. Um, and I can happily say that out of all of um, Bunnings timber product purchases, 84% is linked to a third-party certified source. That's the two major certification schemes, being PEFC or FSC. And um, the remainder of timber that sits outside of that certification is low risk, uh, as we do a risk assessment um, or plantation origin, so um, is not coming from those high risk locations. All right. This is the fundamental platform of why we do what we do. Um, there was, I remember what actually led to this whole issue coming up in 2001. There was an expose on Four Corners and the ABC about illegal ramen and timber pi pirates um, clear felling illegal ramen out of um, the rainforest 
in Southeast Asia and floating it in massive barges and this illegal ramen was ending up in Australia. And um, we got a knock on the door from someone who said that you probably want to have a look at this because if we think you've got it, you'll be hearing from us. And when we had a look at our supply chain, we were unhappy with the evidence we had about where those sources were coming from. And you just cannot associate your business with this activity from an ethical point, from a, you know, who you are as an individual heading up a business um, to be involved with that situation. And that's how we got to where we, where we are now. And in the lead up to the illegal logging laws um, coming into play, we did actually um, join Greenpeace and other major NGOs and civil society in encouraging the federal government. It was the first time that you saw that level of collaboration across industry and NGOs to actually go to the government and say, look, we need this. And to actually make that happen was a landmark situation. And I think it's built the bridge for a lot of future um, understanding there. The future, we're all about the future. This is going to be interesting. The future for us is legality is the absolute baseline here. Do you guys expect that any product you will buy is illegal? Is that acceptable? Regardless of timber, whatever it is, it's got to be legal. There's no marketing angle for a retailer to go out and say, we sell legal product. You know, that's a great marketing edge. Um, the real advantage here is, is to move beyond legality towards sustainability. That's a much longer journey, but it's one that uh, we've certainly weighed into and we'll continue to progress as best we can. Um, there is an issue, I guess, as a uh, as far as embedded cost in the supply chain and when the consumer is actually going to vote with their wallet and encourage sustainable practices and discriminate on that basis. We see it happen when bad news ends up in the media and someone has a campaign against them, then consumers will all jump on board. But what's happening with that quiet, you know, sort of call to action that we all have in our back pocket, um, when that's going to come into play? I mean, that's, that's the reality. Um, however, you know, we've, we've embedded sustainability in these processes and still maintained our lowest prices every day position and our customers do not pay more as a result of us having to go through this process. We find ways of dealing with that in volume incentives, other, other marketing aspects and in lower margins in some of these products that we absorb to get them to market. We've done this one quite a bit. There are some great stories and let me tell you, um, if industry was half as creative and innovative in mounting their marketing campaigns as NGOs are, we'd, we'd be doing a lot better. There's some really smart people involved in these campaigns. This one also links back to APP that Andy spoke about, but I, asked you, I couldn't um, do the hot link for you today, but just go into Google, you have to do this, all right? Type in Ken Dumps Barbie. <laughs> Enough said, Barbie was wrapped up in packaging that was part of the broader campaign against APP and what they did with that concept just went viral on YouTube and it was fantastic. Has anyone seen it? Yeah, it's really good. Okay. We're just about there. And I saved myself some time. Yeah, look, I think I'll, I'll finish up there. Um, really, what I want to leave you with is there's, there's a bigger question here about what is actually sustainable timber? Yes, there are certifications and there's lots of guidance around best forestry practice, but the real judgment is gonna come in 20 to 30 years time when we actually understand whether the certifications that we've all banked on as delivering that actually has worked. And do we still have those forests and those creatures today that we thought we would have because we've gone down the path of um, certified timber? Um, that's the unknown. And that's what the future beholds. Thank you very much.